an honor and a privilege to welcome the poster child of Michigan's economic development, the founder and CEO of ePrize, the world's largest online promotion company and incidentally the largest internet company in the state of Michigan. Josh, truly a pleasure to welcome you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. You are a true success story. A lot of aspiring entrepreneurs want to emulate your success. I want to ask you why and how you started ePrize. Well, like many uh, entrepreneurs, uh, to me, entrepreneurship is all about seeing something that can exist that doesn't yet exist. And I was looking at the internet marketing arena, and I had previously started a company doing web design. And at that time, in 1999, there were hundreds of online advertising companies. And then I looked at the entire marketing sector, and there were almost no promotion companies doing anything online. The promotion industry was this old school, fear-based, good old boy network, and I felt it was ripe for change. So rather than being the 174th mover in the online advertising space, I felt if everyone's going to zig, maybe we should zag. So I saw an opportunity to do something really different, to take this old industry, turn it upside down on its head, and at the same time, create some entrepreneurial success. I have been talking to people here, and they say you do really good promotions. You have very good clients, uh, very high end, I should say, big brand names in the world, Coca-Cola, Adidas, Dell. If you could pick one or two, let's say Coca-Cola and Dell, and you run very good promotions, can you tell us what was unique about it and why they became so popular? Sure. So we, um, you're, you're exactly right. We do uh, interactive promotions for the world's largest brands. We're privileged to work with 74 of the top 100 brands. Coca-Cola is a great example. We've been partners with Coke on things international for years. One neat thing we're doing right now with Coca-Cola, maybe you've seen, is called the My Coke Rewards Program. And basically what happens is if you look under the cap of billions of Coca-Cola products, there's a code, and a consumer can log that code online on the web or through a mobile device and earn reward points. And the consumer can play, use those reward points for a number of different um, items, trips, cars, things like that. So the more Coke you drink, the more rewarded you are. And it's really exciting for a number of reasons. Besides the scale, it's the largest loyalty program Coke has ever run in their existence. And it's in many countries and, and tremendously successful. Um, we do some neat things with technology. Uh, when, for example, if you came online and said that you like Diet Coke, every screen that you see would have a Diet Coke theme to it. And depending on where you are geographically or some of your other tastes and preferences, if you're a skier from the Northwest, all of a sudden it's going to be Diet Coke but skiing in the Northwest. So it very much personalizes the experience to your tastes and your preferences. Uh, the other neat thing about it is that we've been able to extend brand loyalty from one of their products to another. For example, let's say you love Diet Coke, but you don't care which water you drink. Well, now all of a sudden you're going to be motivated to drink Dasani instead of Aquafina. Dasani is a Coke product because you can participate in the My Coke Rewards. So what we've done is we've extended your loyalty from Diet Coke all the way over to water where you didn't previously have a loyalty. So that's been a very, very fun uh, opportunity to work with Coke on, and, and we've been able to forge a lot of new ground and win some good awards along the way. This is an important question probably for the state of Michigan. With so much talent and the creativity required to create all these online promotions, why did you decide to start your company in Michigan? Well, starting and staying are two different reasons. Uh, I started in Michigan because I was here and my family's here and, you know, very close and deep family roots. Um, but I'm actually really excited that, that we started here and very proud that we stayed here. Um, this actually is a fabulous environment for growth in a new economy, oddly enough, even though we're here in the Rust Belt. Uh, we've had tremendous support and assistance from everyone from the governor to the MEDC, Michigan Economic Development Corp., um, to local and state agencies. Um, because we've been able to do something different in this previously manufacturing type arena, um, we are actually very high profile here. We're the largest internet company in the state of Michigan. We've enjoyed a tremendous amount of media attention and support from other entrepreneurs. Um, attracting investment has been very strong here. We've had a, a, been very blessed to have great investors in this community. And the thing that's overlooked about Michigan is the talent pool is fabulous. I mean, there are fantastic people coming out of University of Michigan and other institutions. There's people who have been invested in the auto industry, but they're looking to do something different. And while there's not as many raw number of people here, there are also not that much competition. So we're not competing for the same jobs with Google and Yahoo and other uh, digital companies. I must also ask you this, for most of the entrepreneurs here, they say the policy has to work cohesively with the entrepreneurial activity. So the question really is, for those who are trying to start businesses here, but they say the policy is not conducive, what would you say because you did it you know, throughout? 
Yeah, and, well, you know, you being in Silicon Valley, you realize that there's a very fertile ecosystem, and all the different components that have to come together for entrepreneurial growth exist very readily. There's capital, there's advisors, there's talent, there's ideas, there's uh, universities, and so it, it's, it's an easier go to probably to get off the ground in, in that environment. Here, all those things exist also, but there's really not an interconnected network. It's not as easy to find them. So I would say that um, they exist here, and it's a matter of that good entrepreneurial spirit, the persistence that require, is required ultimately to grow a company, same thing to start a company. You may have to knock on a couple more doors here than you would elsewhere. But I'll tell you, once you get started here, and if you're able to overcome that hurdle, this really is a very good place to do business. Again, you can stand out, the cost basis is low, and um, I would really recommend it to anybody on a national scale to consider this region. Coming to your personal journey, if you were to look back, what do you think were one or two inspirations or one or two uh, big strokes that really motivated you to take the entrepreneurial path? Um, well, from an early age, I always felt like I was the oddball. Not necessarily better, usually not, but different. So if there was a room with 20 people, I was always comfortable being the, the odd man out. And um, at the same time, I felt comfortable questioning things. I had a very strong sense of curiosity. So I could walk into the most state institution. I'd walk into, and see, today I'll walk into a Starbucks and start asking, why don't they have two lines instead of one? How can they brew the coffee this way? Why do they go from left to right? And I just had that innate curiosity as, as part of it. The other thing is I really had a fun um, and sort of non-traditional path. I started my career as a jazz musician. And jazz is all about spontaneous creativity. You know, less than 1% of the notes that are played actually show up on a piece of paper, and the rest you make it up as you go. And I believe that the ability to have that spontaneous creativity combined with curiosity led me to explore entrepreneurship as a career path. And uh, also, I probably couldn't hold a real job, frankly, so I had to do something. I'm sure you have a very young and talented team with you without whom you obviously can't achieve such great things. But for all those entrepreneurs who look up to you, really, uh, not only in this state, but I'm sure throughout the country, what would you advise them if you were to give them you know, like a couple of key takeaways from this interview? Mm. Well, you know, mentioned people, and you're exactly right. Um, great companies are not built on some charismatic CEO. They're built on a team. And uh, one of the things that we focus on more than anything is our culture and building an environment that enables people to reach their highest potential because that allows all of us to reach our highest potential. We try to create a culture that is empowering, one that um, celebrates risk-taking and creativity, and one that also lets everybody in the company, no matter what their position, leave their fingerprints on the company. They're part of the masterpiece that we're creating collectively. And, um, you know, it's funny. People often say, I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do, and then I'll decide later who we are. So they put the what we do in front of the who we are. I would advise anybody starting a company today to do the exact opposite. Start with who we are. Start with the values that will likely be permanent and the foundation for success. The, who, the what you do is going to change many times. We've morphed and changed over the last decade many, many times. But our underlying values, our principles, and our core beliefs have been very consistent. And I believe those are the things that have propped us up in those periods of adversity and allowed us to really reach the levels of success that we've been able to achieve. As a very ambitious and successful young man and an entrepreneur, how much do you think money is relevant to success? I, it's funny because, uh, forgetting me, because I believe this way too, but I, I have, uh, I've been privileged to work with many mentors and I have you know, friends that are, that are billionaires and captains of industry, and I've never sat around and talked with them about money. In fact, if I'm talking about our business and I start talking about our income statement, I always get dirty looks. And it seems to me that the most successful people, the best of the best, the people that achieve world-class success, don't look at money that way. They look at money perhaps as stored energy, but they don't, they're not chasing the money. They view that the money follows their success. They say, let's go create something great. Let's go change the world. Let's go make our mark on society. And then the money is a following, it's sort of a byproduct of their achievement. And the people that I find to be the most um, successful are the ones that are intrinsically motivated because they want to do something special and make a difference. And it's odd because it, it really is ironic. The people that chase money and they say, I'm just going after this to make the money, end up making less money than those who follow their dream and their heart and their passions. Josh, we wish you continued success and thank you for being an inspiration to so many young entrepreneurs around the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.